Hello, everybody, and welcome uh, to the next installment of our One Berkshire Virtual Town Hall series. Uh, my name is Ben Lamb. I am the Director of Economic Development at One Berkshire. Uh, and today, I am here to welcome a, a great set of panelists who are joining us to really talk about um, what this summer is going to look like in the Berkshires. Um, as we know, uh, with COVID-19, uh, a lot has changed uh, in every way, shape, and form. And what that does do is it shifts how things are going to operate here. However, um, as the Berkshires has always been a place for people to go to, to escape, to enjoy um, culture, outdoors, arts, food, everything, um, we know that there's still going to be a summer here in the Berkshires. And so today, uh, we are going to be discussing what that is going to look like uh, to the best of our knowledge and ability right now. Uh, so. Uh, before we get started, uh, I just wanted to mention uh, this is being recorded. It's also being streamed live on uh, Pittsfield Community Television. Uh, so you can access it both now and later if you are not able to join us right at the moment. Um, additionally, if you are with us, uh, if you have questions, uh, please feel free to post those in the Q&A function here in Zoom uh, or in the chat if you uh, prefer that. And after we get through our first set of initial preset questions with our panelists today, uh, we will be asking uh, some of the questions from the audience. So we welcome those. We hope that you post them throughout the entirety of this. Um, and we will get to those towards the end. So without further ado, I'm going to stop my screen share. And we are going to welcome our panelists of the day. Uh, so first off, uh, we have Brian Crewe, who's the director of the Southern Berkshires uh, for the Trustees of Reservation. Um, you may also recognize him uh, from NOMK. Uh, we also have Lori Norton Moffat, who's the director and CEO of the Norman Rockwell Museum. Uh, Mindy Morin, who's the managing director at Canyon Ranch. And Lindsay Schmid, who's the vice president of tourism marketing uh, right here at One Berkshire. Should also note, additionally, my colleague uh, Christine Hoyt is here. She's the wizard behind the curtain helping me out for the day. Um, so we have a, a great panelist set. Uh, and a great team here uh, for hopefully a really uh, interesting and dynamic conversation. So without further ado, you're gonna stop listening to me, Babylon, uh, and we are going to welcome our guests to introduce themselves. So um, just to kick us off, to get the conversation going, if each of you could just take two to three minutes and you know, say good morning, welcome the audience, uh, the attendees here, and you know, share kind of the, the current state of affairs, the, the status update for your respective businesses, organizations, um, just to give us kind of an initial lay of the land uh, when we get this picked up. And to start us off, I think we're gonna start with Lori. You're on mute there, Lori. Classic. <laughs> Good morning. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here with you and really to bring some hope to the community about uh, what summer in the Berkshires uh, can look like. And I'm here representing Norman Rockwell Museum. And as uh, most of you probably know, our galleries closed on March 13th and our buildings have been closed since then in compliance with the COVID safety. Uh, we are uh, on 36 acres of grounds, beautiful uh, land to enjoy and walk. And uh, we'll talk more later about how we're looking forward to opening, uh, looking toward mid-July. Great, thank you. Uh, next up, Mindy. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, so here at Canyon Ranch, very similar to what Lori said, unfortunately, we did temporarily close in the second week of March and continue to be closed. Um, it's definitely been really amazing to see the community that has formed around the Berkshires for the reopening and how everyone's really come together as a community. Um, I think for, for us, we've been spending this time to ensure when we do come back, the safety of our colleagues, which will be the most important and the safety of our guests when that is able to happen. And we just, I was saying earlier uh, to a couple people, we're also taking the time to really reflect and enjoy our property and see our 110 acres in a different way. And although we have turtles that have just moved in to our parking area, we're, we're also looking at how we could really have our guests enjoy this beautiful space more than they ever had when we, when we are able to reopen and welcome everyone back. Wonderful. 
Uh, next up, Lindsay. Sorry about my little glitch there with <laughs> my internet switched over to my phone. Thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, my role at One Berkshire as the VP of Tourism and Marketing really kicks off um, right when this whole thing sort of hit us really hard in terms of marketing the Berkshires for the summer. And so my role sh has shifted in terms of making sure that One Berkshire and the organization itself is doing all we can to support. I believe we may have lost uh, Lindsay on the cell too at the moment. Um, so for the moment, let's jump over to Brian and then we'll come back to Lindsay as soon as she's able to rejoin. Sure, no problem. Um, so I'm the director for the Southern Berkshires here at the Trustees of Reservations. Uh, and that is eight properties, uh, including on Keg. So um, we've kind of been in different modes of open and closed from the beginning. A lot of our recreational sites have remained open, um, but Nam Keg and Monument Mountain have both been closed kind of through the duration of this. Uh, Nam Keg opened up yesterday to timed uh, reservations. Uh, so we're taking in about 20 cars an hour now uh, for people to walk through the garden and then Monument Mountain we're going to reopen on June the 2nd so next Tuesday um, and we're looking forward to that I know a lot of other people are too but uh, sometimes these recreational spaces can be really challenging just because they are loved by a lot of people and they can become overcrowded really quickly and we've been really conscious of the safety of people, you know, not just from COVID, but always on the mountain and the time of our first responders, you know, that sometimes can often get really taken up with incidents that occur up there. So that's been a bit of a tricky one for us. Uh, we're going to open it on Tuesday, though, and see how it goes. Great. Uh, so, you know, when Lindsay comes back, uh, we'll, we'll have her join back into the conversation. But, um, but you know, jumping right into it, uh, We've all seen the, you know, the governor has laid out uh, a set of kind of phased approaches. We've seen kind of the, the master document that exists and um, some detail in terms of phase one, obviously. Um, but with that kind of announced phase approach, um, there's a lot of moving pieces. Um, and, you know, there can be a lot of confusion uh, as well that comes along with that. So, you know, kind of looking at your, your individual um, operations, businesses, organizations, um, how, when looking at that information, uh, how are you looking at that as your roadmap for reopening? And anyone can take it away. I'm not well, I'll be happy to um, kick it off uh, because we have a little bit more time as a museum than um, the trustees, for example, who are able to open their properties in this first phase. And museums are in the third phase of opening. And that means the earliest museums would look at opening would be early July. And uh, for the case of Norman Rockwell Museum, we're targeting mid-July. It's possible that these phases will, as was announced in New York today, uh, they were about to cycle into phase two, but they're waiting on data experts to analyze the healthcare uh, results after phase one, so there's a slight delay in opening. So we're building that buffer time in and spending that time on all of the uh, both program plans and our heart quickens to think about getting back in the galleries and bringing art um, to the world. I think um, we have some humorous exhibitions that will be really wonderful for healing and uh, uplifting the community, but of course all the safety precautions uh, that we're all being asked to create from time to ticketing, to the cleansing methodology of our sites, to one-way navigation, uh, and having policies in place. So we're taking the time to put all of those details in place and uh, put our programming in place for mid-July opening. Yeah, and I think that, you know, the governors, when you kind of look at the different, you know, that phase one kind of document that the governor's office put out, you know, there are some very specific things, like, these are the things you have to have, right? So though you can start there. And then for us, you know, being part of a statewide organization, there's another level of, you know, it, you need to have these things on top of that, you know, which is what we're going to mandate. And so we, of course, implement those 
you know, precautions. And then I think it kind of comes down to a staff safety level where you have a conversation with, you know, your staff to see what they're comfortable with and, you know, what they need to feel, you know, secure coming to work and welcoming the public every day. You know, so we've, you know, there, there's different kind of levels of, you know, these precautions that originate from different places, you know, but I feel like at the end of the day, and, you know, definitely at NAMCAG yesterday when we had our first day welcoming the public back, you know, you really saw what was working, you know, where kind of, you know, there may be a, a couple of points where just like, oh, okay, so maybe we'll shift this, we'll do this a little bit differently. But, you know, I've been very surprised and pleasantly surprised at how respectful people in the Berkshires have really been kind of helping us to move along this agenda of a secure and safe reopening. You know, people have been really great about wearing masks, maintaining that social distancing. So, you know, that is a really important part to this, you know, I, I, as we welcome the public back, just how much of a partner they are with us as we attempt to do this. Because if they're not going to help us by showing up and voluntarily meeting these guidelines and maintaining these social distancing requests, you know, wearing a mask while they're on site, you know, the name that might force us our hand in reconsidering how we open or being open at all. So I think the messaging around the public when we welcome them back and making sure they know what the expectations are when they are coming to us is one of the most important parts of a reopening process, at least for at, at our sites, it has been for sure. And I think for for us at, at the ranch, um, we're in between all phases. With I so the first phase was salon, into the second phase is when hospitality and hotels could open up with guidelines, and then the third third phase um, would be the gyms. So for us, we're kind of in the center. We're in the middle of, of when is the best time for us to open. And I think for many of the places in the Berkshires, we, we welcome people from all over the world. I think we'll be welcoming people mainly from driving distance and, and really knowing what those guidelines are going to be in regards to uh, self-quarantine from other states, that's going to be important. Um, the guidelines that were put forward with the salon openings and everything that opened in, in phase one, those were great. And now we just need those for the rest of them. And, um, and, I, and we're very confident that they'll come and they're going to be very well thought of, which they already have been. Um, for us here, we we are really lucky that we have an excellent team um not only everyone that works in in every area who's been offering us really great feedback and thoughts but we also have our doctors so we have our doctors at this property as well as our tucson property and um dr carmona who's on our staff and that has been really amazing in navigating through those great pretenders of this is what you need. This is the only cleaning thing that's going to work. Hands down and right now, limited time, you could get a hundred of them for $9.99 <laughs> or all of those other, those emails that we're all getting and phone calls that we're all getting and across social media. So, so really sifting through what actually will work mm -hmm. and what actually is going to be safe for our guests and our colleagues. Um, they've been really helpful with that. And you know, similar to Lori, we have some time because really we're we're going. We are then allowed to fully open at third at the third phase um, to to work on those standard operating procedures um, to to work on what it's what it's going to look like with this new normal. Um, so I think guidelines for us too would be helpful in terms of what is that what what is that amount of people what is that percentage. Um, for guidelines in terms of if it's a fitness class or if it's um, a hike outside or programming that we do because we're very program heavy here at, at Canyon Ranch. And that's actually a, a great point and something that, you know, I'd love to hear you, Lori and Brian as well, you know, um, some of those pieces that you really would need to see, right? So what are those, um, there, there definitely has been a lot of thorough information for the phase one. Um, even to a fault sometimes where people just don't know what information to read and how to find it. Um, but the website that the state has put together, I would say, has a lot of information for the ones that have been allowed to open so far. I'm kind of curious if you see any gaps in uh, 
spaces, niches where you would see really important uh, necessary information for your successful reopening to you know the extent that you can in the near future. Yeah, I think um, to Mindy's point, uh, all of our sites tend to be program intensive. Uh, the museum programming will shift quite a bit this summer because we know there are going to be limitations on gatherings. And the notion of uh, guided led docent tours with people packed shoulder to shoulder in a gallery uh, will not be happening in that way this summer. We will you know, be deciding how many people physically can be in one space. It will be very thin. It'll be a luxurious experience in many ways um, to have the privacy to look at art with only a handful of people in each space. So moving to time ticketing to be able to uh, modulate how people flow through the museum and thinking through different ways to share the information that we've always enjoyed sharing in a highly personal way. Uh, similarly, lectures uh, won't happen in a room with 100 people. Auditoriums can't convene right now. So uh, we've pivoted to our virtual museum for delivery of our programming. And it's been wonderfully uh, supported and appreciated in the community, supported by our patrons. And we will look for ways to continue to share information in those ways, side by side with the physical experiences in the galleries. And I just wanted to pick up on what Brian said about how respectful visitors have been already to the sites and, and parks and places that are open. I think we saw this very early uh, embrace and adoption of this behavior throughout the Berkshires when we were among the earliest communities in Massachusetts to spike with this uh, known cases of this illness and people really honored the safety measures, the stay at home, the workplaces that shut down. And so we are seeing the same thing, the willingness to uh, abide by masking and um, certainly all the hand washing, sanitation and social distancing. So I'm confident that people will return to the museum in safe ways and appreciate that uh, we're all working so hard to be able to both provide a season as well as keep um, our, our visitors, our employees, and uh, anyone who comes on the campus um, safe and, and able to enjoy an uplifting experience. Yeah, I think for us kind of, you know, and Lori kind of touched on this, as did Mindy, you know, I think that all of us are kind of struggling, one, to identify what PPE and cleaning materials and like, you know, are the best to use, and two, then, sourcing them is very, very challenging. Um, so I think that, you know, it, it would be great if there was some sort of consensus and supply, you know, which I know is kind of, uh, you know, on everyone's wish list, but, you know, that's really, you know, one of the things we're struggling with most. And then also just kind of how many people are we allowed to have, you know, a lot, because a lot of those guidelines indicate like a 20% occupancy, right? So is that our parking lot? Is that based mm -hmm. on like our all time like high, you know, attendance at like winter lights one night, <laughs> you know, like, what is that, you know, where, where's the in between? There's a lot of gray areas, I think, on some of those directives where I, I, I think it'll kind of suss itself out over time and it's just gonna be left up to us and the public, you know, with what they're comfortable with everyone's comfortable with you know so maybe it's great for a reason um but i think right now and you know what we're all you know I, I won't speak for anyone else but what i've been really struggling with is just kind of sourcing the amount of ppe that you need to really open clean regularly supply people with like masks if they come onto property if they don't have them right like that's a big question you what do you do like do you just have i can barely find enough for my staff right now how do i do supply them for people who are coming in as well it's not a matter of you know that's one a huge expense you know also dealing with this it would be kind of nice if there was some sort of <laughs> um, support kind of in a way for us to kind of deal with those because adding that level of maintenance on top of an already kind of very labor intensive, you know, industry, you know, which the tourism industry is, is at a reduced capacity on top of it is really hard. Um, so it's, that's, that's kind of been a challenge as we try to work through all of that. How do you find it? And then how do you absorb it into an already struggling and tight budget? Right. And, you know, I, I was sorry. Um, I was going to say this actually moves very nicely over to kind of the redefining piece. But Mindy, if you had something 
Well, you know, I I was just also going to add, um, we could be very well educated and educate our staff and give them the confidence, but how do we educate those that are coming to visit? And, And are there guidelines that could be established for, for that. Um, you know, I think for, for us, as we look at what reopening looks like, um, we're, we're going to, we already reach out to any guests that come, but we're going to take that time to not only curate their experience with us, but also just remind them of the guidelines in Massachusetts and remind them of social distancing and remind them to wear masks and if, if remind them that there may be temperature checks. Um, also let them know what's going on around the town of Lenox as well. So if there's outdoor dining or whatever that might be. Um, there was also a question that, that popped up just in regards to projections for the summer and bookings and occupancy. I think that's really still unfortunately up in the air with the timeline of, of opening up. Um, I will say that town is busy. I will say there's more cars than, than, than we've seen in the recent weeks, which is good to see. Um, I think that One of the things that Lindsay mentioned on a previous call, um, we've been quarantined and cooped up for so long. The experiences that we are wanting to provide to guests that are coming in the future as we reopen will really be something easy for them to absorb. Mm -hmm. So it has to be, it has to be easy. It has to be curated. Um, It has to be something that's going to be comfortable. Um, maybe not having to make so many decisions on what lecture to go see and what services to do, but, but really have these, what we're creating are these pathways to make it easier. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that that's going to hopefully drive more of the drive business and um, bring even new guests to the, to the Berkshires who maybe have not come here before. I think our outdoor space lends so well to that and all of our amazing hiking and biking and, and museums and parks that, that we have. And that's, that's actually a really great segue too, because, um, you know, summer is still going to happen. It's going to look different. We, we know that. We've seen closures of certain things. We've seen postponement of other things, some hospitality destinations, um, you know, continuing to make decisions as we go forward. And, you know, from all of your perspectives, you know, we, we recently host, or held a, a survey of, you know, the visitor economy folks that normally um, have come to the Berkshires in the past. We had over a thousand people respond to that. And there was a lot of really interesting stuff about what they might be interested in coming to. Uh, and you've all sort of touched on bits and pieces of that. But I'm curious, you know, what do you see as those primary drivers to hit this new, um, this newly defined summer that we're seeing? You know, how, how do you, what do you see as sort of that, um, that market that we're going to try to reach? Well, I'll just note that uh, seven properties, cultural sites, historic sites, um, have shared a joint announcement today that we'll all be reopening our grounds and we really believe people are going to first have a pent-up desire to be outdoors after having been in the home for eight, nine, ten weeks and now with the beautiful season upon us which can be so short-lived here in the Berkshires uh, we just know we're all eager to have some sunshine and fresh air so including the trustees properties that Brian has mentioned the Berkshire Botanical Garden, Chesterwood, the Mount, uh, Hancock Shaker Village, as well as Norman Rockwell Museum and the Tanglewood Grounds will all be open or opening uh, in the very near future for public enjoyment. And all of these properties have uh, traditionally welcomed people on the grounds. And we have more than 1,300 acres of trails and uh, sculpture parks and even baby animals at Hancock Shaker Village, uh, which will all be outside and very safely accessible with careful, easy distancing, um, honoring the governor's guidelines of wearing masks and, and just keeping our social groups um, somewhat spread out. So I think this is an exciting opportunity for our community, especially when we've all been so sad that our performing arts sister institutions have had to forfeit an entire season uh, for the safety of their artists and the visiting public. And, you know, this is a real loss in our community 
both from a cultural um, and healing perspective as well as the economic impact of that. So we're just um, so pleased that we do have uh, sites with grounds um, and also including in Northern Berkshire, the Clark, uh, Mass Mocha, places with large outdoor spaces as well as all the um, you know, sanctuaries, Mass Audubon, Pleasant Valley, Canoe Meadows, places and in, in our mountains and state parks and forests. Um, the Berkshires really have a very special amenity uh, where people can come and enjoy safely, we believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, I couldn't agree more. I think that, you know, people are going to keep coming to the Berkshires and enjoy the Berkshires for the same reason they have for, you know, hundreds of years. It's because summer is here is spectacular. You know, it's like, it's, it's a really just in terms of the nature, the scenery, the diversity that it offers offers just in its outdoor offerings you know that is what has drawn people here for so long and i think that it's going to continue to do that and I, you know one of the things i think we need to be prepared for are people who are day tripping from right because the berkshires are in a very different position from a lot of other places where you can get to it in under two hours from a lot of different places and i think that as travel kind of reduces itself to, you know, car travel and, you know, places that you can go within driving distance. I think we're going to see a lot of people doing that um, here, whether that's to hike our trails, you know, visit our properties, grounds, you know, go canoeing down the Housatonic, you know, there are just so many things that people can do. Um, and, you know, we're a short drive from New York, we're a short drive from Boston and Albany and, you know, a million different places in Connecticut. It, you know, it's, we're accessible. And I think that there's going to be a lot of people coming in. And, you know, I know that there has been some tension that has existed, you know, with those people coming in, you know, and as we try to keep these events semi-local right now, um, so that people aren't traveling and we're not really encouraging that outside influx of visitors. You know, I'm curious to see how that will change as the summer progresses. Uh, and, you know, the, the different ways we kind of communicate that, right? Because it's been a very kind of tricky thing as we've opened, you know, because we've tried to make that part of our messaging, right? That we're opening on a reservation-based system for local audiences, because we still don't want to encourage people coming from too far away, because um, that's just not part of this phase one reopening, and we're trying to honor that. Uh, and I think as the summer progresses and these phases roll out, you know, how that changes and how we communicate that is going to be interesting to see. <laughs> and that, that, that gets to our next point too. And I'm, I'm going to try to, I'm, I'm getting some uh, notes from Lindsay as we're sitting here too, um, just to, you know, kind of convey some of the stuff on her end as well in that, um, you know, uh, we're seeing this and several, you know, so a couple of you have already mentioned this, but in terms of our cultural institutions that do have large spaces that they can occupy and that that press release that just came out Lori, is fantastic and that's a really exciting moment um to see that i, I that's a that's a, a a shining star in a moment that may not have that many of them right now and i think that that's that's really great to hear um but that also you know for us as a, a marketing organization um it's also an opportunity for us to look at a different audience that might not have been um drawn here during the summer as much in terms of uh you know different age demographics different radius so really focusing on that drive market um and you know that idea of safety and being very considerate of safety um you know to the nth degree uh and making sure that you know the the customers the visitors that are looking for um a safe place to enjoy with family and friends um with lots of expansive space is right here in their backyard I just would like to um, build on that because there are a couple of questions in the Q&A and on the chat about capacity and uh, just to let you know we're at Norman Rockwell Museum we're thinking about estimating that we'll operate at about 25 percent of our typical capacity and that is one a conservative estimate because we do think some people will be slow to step out and that certain age cohorts are not being encouraged to travel and be out and about yet but we also want to step into this slowly because safety is so important 
And we've seen examples internationally. Uh, museums have the advantage, I think, of looking at how museums in Europe and Asia are reopening. And just this morning, read that Seoul, now uh, South Korea, has just done a two-week shutdown because they started to see numbers of illness spiking. And uh, so we think it's very important to uh, start slowly and really be here for the community. There are so many people here that might not be taking vacations other places and there will be wonderful things. I, I know in past years we've talked about staycations, but it's really true. We have so much beauty around us and so much opportunity and we aim and I know the Clark is uh, planning to open galleries and be able to have some artistic experiences as well, but it's important to step out carefully, be here first for the community and our, and that includes all of our second home residents who have been here through the spring and would typically be enjoying all the performing arts. Um, we have a wonderful day trip region as well between Albany, Springfield, Vermont, Connecticut, and I think that's going to be the dominant audience for a while. We've seen quite a bit of cancellation in the coach tour business because they can't travel safely as in groups. So um, we want to be here first for our community. I wanted to add a note that at Norman Rockwell Museum, we'll be offering free admission for the rest of the year to all of the frontline healthcare workers and um, people that really sacrificed and stepped up to take care of us all during this um, period and you know I think those are the ways we want to help our community heal and really be here to um, take care of the Berkshires and then build what has been our tourism infrastructure. Um, there are questions on lodging and B&Bs that I'm not qualified to answer but Mindy you might know something about the, the lodging inquiries coming into the region. Yeah you know um again that's it's really all based on the on the guidelines i think having been reading a lot about what the hospitality industry is doing it's sitting between that 30 to 40 percent occupancy and because in really any area if it's if it's inns or if it's hotels it's very hard to social distance, even more so um, as some of the B&Bs, and I've been on a couple calls with the innkeepers, and that's tough. And, and I think what's, what's really challenging for, for the inns, um, and not to speak on behalf of them, but in my opinion, and having grown up in that industry, um, is you have, a, you have a different type of guest that stays at a bed and breakfast, and they really want that family feel like they're coming to their second home and how do you offer that with a virtual hug you know how do you how do you make them feel warm and safe in a place that maybe they've been coming to that bed and breakfast for over 20 years they come every year to the berkshires just to go to that one place um so i think that that's gonna that will always that's going to be a challenge i think um for for us there's a, some questions in there about staffing and, and how does that look? Um, I think it's, it's really, again, we're waiting on the guidelines to see how many people can we safely have here. But as Lori said, we don't wanna rush into it either because as we've already seen, when, when other places have rushed into it, they've taken one step forward to take two, three, four, five, six steps back. Mm -hmm. And that's not what we wanna do, because I think that we need to um, then think about the community because we're bringing people in to our community and we wanna keep our community safe as well. So we, we don't wanna rush. Um, we don't wanna rush back on, um, on opening and, if the protocols are not there because we want to be sure that we can keep our colleagues safe we want to be sure that we can keep our guests safe um, and we want to be sure that we're we're not part of taking any steps back so i'm actually i'll put my lindsay hat back on here real quick um that that's very much so you know in terms of the marketing of the berkshires right so that's one of our major roles at one berkshire and you know making sure that we're being strategic in how we do that both in terms of messaging and timing, right? So we're not we're not going to send out a marketing campaign before it's safe and you know responsible to do so. Um, and what that marketing looks like is you know very much so that you know local market not doing too far of a reach and really talking about you know make the Berkshires your backyard, 
this idea of backyard picnics and everything that people are really get, you know, getting into as it gets warmer outside, um, making those opportunities uh, notable and recognized here in the Berkshires as a, a thing that they can do here. Um, and that's, you know, that's as the market's changing over the summer and everything. Um, and also, you know, that, that starts to get to a point of um, ensuring consumer confidence in the long term. And I think that that, you know, you've all sort of started to touch on that a little bit, but I'd love to hear from each of you around that, um, you know, because as we are looking at our marketing campaign and we, you know, we're trying to accumulate enough capital to support a robust marketing campaign when the timing is right. Um, before we get to that point, we also want to be in, you know, able to ensure that when people start to come in, it doesn't degrade that consumer confidence. Right, they want to feel safe now, but they also don't want to necessarily go to a space that um, a flare-up occurs. So I'm, you know, just kind of as sort of a last structured topic here. Um, that term, you know, consumer confidence has been mentioned a lot, um, and so I'm, I'm wondering, you know, how do you think that that could impact this summer in terms of how it gets structured, how the reopenings, as the other phases start to roll out. Um, how do you see that playing into the the conversation and the movements going forward? You know, I kind of, it's going to be tricky because I think that we've all seen as we watch what happens across the country and in different parts of the world, there are people who have varying levels of comfortability, you know, as they kind of re-enter the world, right? And there's different theologies around it. And I think that the, best thing that we can do here in the Berkshires is what, you know, Lori referred to earlier was what we've already done. You know, we were one of the first places here in the state that saw a spike in this and we acted very quickly and that helped us to get those under control. And now it's, I think we just had three new cases yesterday, but up until then, you know, it had been a couple of weeks before we had any new ones. Um, and I also think that kind of, you know, just what these seven institutions have done with this press release, in just assuring people that we are there for them, that we are reopening, and then we are doing it in a safe way. And just again, that messaging to everybody that it is a group effort, that we are all doing this, that we are all trying to be there for each other, and that it's a team effort, right? Like, if you're gonna be here, and if everyone's wearing a mask, you know, like if you're the only one in the grocery store not wearing a mask, you're gonna pr probably put a mask on. You know, so like if we if we as a community are all kind of committing to this and being part of the solution and the group effort that it takes to control this, and it is visible, you know, in our in our own lives and in the way we run our sites and our businesses, you know, I think that's where the real consumer confidence comes from. Yeah. You know, and it's, I think that that's what will bring people here. It will keep them coming here. And I think it's what will get people to comply with what we're all trying to do. And related to these, this question, there are a number of questions on the chat and uh, Q&A that I think relate to this notion of how many people can gather. There are questions about gathering at events, uh, how long you can stay with a timed ticket, uh, where are picnic tables, and what we're understanding at the moment is a lot of this will be actually issued in guidance from the governor per industry standard. So for example, if you're in a phase one business right now, you're only permitted to bring um, like 25% of your office work or, or all of your employees back into the building. So we're working on who needs to go in to change art, change exhibits, set up all the protocols, and who can still keep doing their work from home. Uh, gatherings are not permitted yet in more than groups of 10, I believe, is the current guidance. So a lot of these questions that folks are asking, I think we have to listen to what guidance comes out in each phase, phase two, phase three. Um, we know the distancing expectations now for restaurants and tables. There's a lot of outdoor eating opportunity, but there's a lot of uh, strict requirements after that. So question about picnic tables, or we're looking at our cafe at the museum. Uh, you have to clean those tables after each visitor sits at them, after each and every meal. So this notion that you, you know, quickly grab your sandwich and sit down at a table might mean uh, picnics on the grounds, on the lawn, mm -hmm. and inviting people. I love those pictures in New York City of the circles um, chalked mm -hmm. onto the grass lawns that 
you know, show people how to sit far enough apart to feel safe. And with our wonderful large lawn, we're thinking that might be a fun way to do picnics or move seating out all over uh, the campus but it all has to be cleaned in between. So I would urge for those who are asking questions about these numbers expectations to follow carefully the guidance coming out in each phase because that's what we're having to do for our businesses to understand how much staff we can bring back in and that will relate to how many visitors we actually can have in a given day. Um, and I'll just note that for Norman Rockwell Museum, uh, we don't we we want the timed ticketing ticketing to be um, gracious and spacious enough that you can spend as long as you would like there. We're not going to be rushing people through in order to get more people through. We actually will be honoring uh, keeping the galleries uh, sparsely populated so that everybody can be safe and everyone can be assured of arriving in their general time but having a nice um, long visit both on the grounds and and within the museum and and a question came up about um, spas and salons um, again I think because we are in between phases and really wanting to be mindful of doing the right thing and, and not rushing into anything once you know, as Lori just, just also mentioned, once we know more about the guidelines, especially for salon and, and hospitality and the gym, um, it, it appears since we, we lay mainly in phase two and three, for, for us, it would be waiting for the guidelines for everything. So for two and three. Um, so once those are established, then we'll have a better idea of what we could do and what we could safely do. Um, the spa is a tough one. That's that's one that we, our corporate spa director and our VP of spa and, and our entire team here have been working probably the most on um, because that's the one that's the trickiest. And, and really any space where you're in a close proximity to other people where it is hard to social distance. So that's really where, we're, where the guidelines are gonna be very important for us. Um, Luckily, the spa industry and the hospitality industry as a whole has really stepped up and there's been webinars upon webinars regarding just this topic from everywhere from iSpa to, uh, to some of the bigger, the bigger names in the spa industry and really pooling together. So although, although there's a task force put together for the opening of the Berkshires and there's task, force, task forces that are put together for all industries, the spa has one as well. Um, and we're just following that trend and, and figuring out what we need in terms of PPE, in terms of shields, in terms of the cleanliness, in terms of time between seatings. Um, that's, that's, all, that's all things to consider that we're still pausing on for now. Oh, you're on mute there, Lori. Ben, you had mentioned uh, you know, how to market, how to think mm -hmm. of reaching the publics, and there's a question about staying in communication with audiences. Right. Um, I'd be happy to circle back with uh, One Berkshire and all of our Ber One Berkshire members. There's been a tremendous amount of survey that's been being done, particularly in the museum community. So both locally with individual museums, and we are plugged into two national surveys, and the questions have been very, very helpful about revealing what people feel they need to feel safe to return to visit and when they think they might return to visit. So there might be uh, ways to pair marketing strategies around what the visitor comfort levels have expressed and um, certainly be able to work with Lindsay and, and share that information. And that actually, that's, we did get a specific question via email, but we've also gotten a few on here around the marketing piece and we sort of touched on that a bit. Uh, thank you, Lori, for that as well. Uh, but from the one Berkshire end of things, just, uh, you know, if I was Lindsay again, um, in terms of what we're doing specifically, um, so we have a number of uh, efforts that we put in place uh, regularly. We use a lot of digital retargeting. We use a lot of uh, public relations work that we're getting in different media sources. So a lot of stories that are going out and that's just our regular operational uh, stuff, but that's going to kind of go into overdrive, um, specifically targeting what offerings we have here in the Berkshires that do make us unique and special. 
Um, so one of the big tools, um, we have an initial PR uh, push that's going to be going out, and that's going to uh, start a five-month uh, digital retargeting campaign. And those campaigns are really important because they're specifically hitting on audiences that, you know, it, it's not just a broad reach thing. We're not just throwing things out into the universe and hoping that it hits the right person at the right time. It's really meant to um, hit on audiences that are already somewhat primed to come to the Berkshires for one reason or another, and to just push them over the edge, right? Just to like get them past that trigger point um, to actually get them into the, the area. Uh, and so those campaigns are being fleshed out and built. Um, again, they're, they're pretty capital uh, heavy. So uh, you know, building that, that resource pool in order to support a collective impact marketing campaign is uh, one of the, the big lifts on our organization right now. Um, but definitely tuning it to the needs of the organizations and the um, businesses that exist here and that are looking to bring people in. Not every business is obviously looking to pull people in right now, but um, to add to that and to kind of go off of Lori's remarks there, um, I'm curious if either you, Mindy, or Brian um, have kind of a, a lens on what your marketing push might look like um, with this new um, new vision of the, the future and you know how far out or how early do you need that marketing to go out before the doors are actually open so that there's a, an adequate kind of rollout, right? So it's not, you don't market something the day you open, you market it a little before so that you get some lead time. And I'm just kind of curious what that looks like in terms of timelines for y'all. I think kind of for us, it's to be determined a little bit. I think <laughs> right now it's, marketing right now is so tricky right? Because like you want to let people know that you're open, but you don't want to seem like you're pushing it too hard and that you're trying to get too many people to come or to get them to come from too far away, you know? So it's, you know, I think trying to be sensitive to that, but also try to, you know, look, it, we're all still Still trying in some way or another to drive revenue right like we're all like so desperate for that right now you know and you know it's it's hard it, it's hard to do that and still kind of hold back the reins on the marketing right like you know I'm used to just like blowing up Facebook and Instagram with flowers and like lights and pumpkin you know it's, and can't do that really because it kind of comes across as almost insensitive to the community or, you know, kind of counterintuitive to what we're trying to accomplish as a community right now from a health perspective, that's really hard. And I think that what we've been really marketing right now is just information, you know, and it's just like, again, those safety, you know, things that people can help us do when they come to the property, really targeting our advertising, you know, just in the small advertising we are doing, very locally, right? So like all that Facebook targeting messaging and Instagram, you know, like really keeping it to within 15 miles of, you know, you know, Stockbridge per se, or, you know, Bart's Cobble, you know, in Sheffield, you know, just so that we're kind of getting those people, you know, who are in the area, who are not going to have to travel very far, who may have never like really discovered these places before, but this is a really perfect opportunity because we know these people are ready to get out of their house and like do something with their kids. And this is a great time to discover nature in the Berkshires if that's not a necessarily part of your life right now um, and I think reaching those people for us right now is more important kind of than the outside and I think that, again it'll be interesting to see how that kind of evolves you know but I, I, just on a personal you know observation I'll tell you all of my friends from New York though are calling me and asking me do I know anywhere here available for rent can you put me in touch with the realtor you know they are if you watch the housing market here at all you are noticing that things are flying off the market really really quickly you know so I think that that message is out people are looking at us again for a place to have you know maybe not a second home this time maybe their primary residence and I think that that's a big shift that we can really on the long term has the you know has there's the potential there to really change the you know the dynamics of the Berkshires and <laughs> in a very different way, I think, in this, because people are leaving the cities and they're looking to us again as a place to live and build a life. And I think that that's really where we have the opportunity um, to kind of market ourselves in a different way.
that feels like a whole nother town hall that we can have. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's it it's it's so true. I think you know for for when it comes to a timeline of when to market and how to market, it's that's it's that's a, a tough thing to answer. I think for us, for the past several weeks, we've launched um, Canyon Ranch Resiliency, and we have our chefs from some of our properties and our doctors and and our nutritionist and um, and our exercise physiologists doing videos, short videos or um, that are five to 10 to 20 minutes um, that that are really start that really resonate with people. So it's giving them a, a taste of we're still here. We're acknowledging what is going on in the world right now. And although we can't be together, let's be together virtually and, and giving them tips and tricks to get through everything that's happening right now. Um, I, I, I couldn't agree more with the real estate market. It's there from bidding wars to um, houses being as soon as they go up, they're sold. It's, it's been pretty, pretty fascinating to watch. And I think that's, that this is a really great opportunity for us to market ourselves, Brian, as you said, is make this your primary place to live. Get out of the city. You, the second homeowners, I'm sure, are rethinking. I know just where I live, um, they're rethinking, do, do I need to go back to Boston? Do I need to go back to New York? Is this where I should be? Not only because of this, but because I feel better in this open space. Um, I, I feel safer already. I feel more, um, more connected to my family being here. And, and I think that, you know, although this is a really very extremely challenging time for everybody, it's given us all time to reflect and and that is that's i think has been really important for for us in our marketing of look at yourself how could how could we help you and how could you help yourself through this time and that's a really the on the real estate piece to anecdotally something interesting and I, I forget who told this to me the other day and i didn't even really think about it is a lot of these homes that had been second homes or um were a vacation home and then used as short-term rentals people are putting out mailboxes and that mm -hmm. is just an interesting little psychological trigger of, you know, there's a sense that they're staying a little bit longer if they're actually putting a mailbox out. And I'd like to also um, just reflect on and call our attention to all of the residents and citizens in our community who uh, are experiencing financial challenges, who have lost jobs, who have food insecurity. Um, there's been tremendous uh, support and stepping up to help um, be here for families uh, who have long-standing or new needs and I think it's important for us to be really mindful how to be present for um, all of our residents and neighbors here in the Berkshires. Um, we uh, There's some questions about will grounds be free? I wanted to suggest everybody check the individual sites uh, organizations websites because each each site has different criteria the time ticketing is required by the, the governor but we understand and we will be looking at uh, you know our fee structure but I'll pay what you can for those who can't there are going to be accommodations to in order to make sure that healing can begin for everyone in the Berkshires and I know, um, you know, we're all so dependent on a visitor and economy for um, the economics of our community, but getting all of our residents back on their feet and nurturing them will also help heal and get our community standing back on its feet. So uh, I know all of the organizations, sites and businesses are, are super mindful of how to be present for all of our visitors. Yeah, I would absolutely agree. I think there's been a, a huge rally in this community, um, which is one of the reasons that I love living here, just as a, you know, a nudge for, we did say someone actually in the chat who indicated, uh, as you were talking about real estate, Brian, that um, they're actually moving here from Brooklyn, they're moving up to Adams within the next month. So that's a, that's a kind of a, a case study right there, um, which is, is nice to see. And that, that community piece, Lori, is definitely um, an immense part of what makes living here uh, wonderful. Um, one uh, additional question sort of around the, um, the marketing piece, there was one, uh, one person here that was asking about the differentiation between us and somewhere like Hudson, which is, you know, 
right over the border in New York. Uh, you know, how do you how do you differentiate um, the outdoor piece? And I did get an exact quote from Lindsay to that question that I want to read just because I could never, you know, come up with the same language that she did. So um, this is from Lindsay. Our outdoors is not just found on a mountaintop or a lake, uh, but on a hillside next to cows and an amazing outdoor sculpture at the Clark or a bird walk on the grounds of Edith Wharton's home. It's the juxtaposition of outdoor with culture that has always made us unique. And I think that that is actually a, a really great statement that sort of encompasses um, why even if you can't necessarily go into a building or into a cultural institution, enjoying their grounds uh, gives you that connection to both culture and outdoor recreation simultaneously that you don't really get anywhere else. Um, so I felt like that was worth just uh, noting to that particular question out there. Um, going off on a, a totally different tangent, um, not focusing on marketing with this one, uh, we had a, a couple questions around the PPE. Um, and I noticed that you know there was some touching on that as we were discussing earlier on uh, around supplying it for your staff, for your guests, uh, the, the cleaning equipment, making sure that you're navigating best practices there, Mindy, like you mentioned. Um, you know, kind of curious, um, do you see significant gaps in what's available? Um, how are you making up for those gaps as you look at a reopening process? Um, we, uh, on the call, we actually have Tyler Fairbank who mentioned that he's got PPE that he's able to provide at cost for folks, for agencies and such. Um, but wondering, you know, what do you see as some of those gaps and challenges in terms of providing enough, both for your staff and for your guests to make sure that folks feel safe and you still have that, that level of uh, security there. Well, if we can put out a commercial for another wonderful One Berkshire member, I know when we asked this question a few weeks back, uh, Bart indicated from Car Hardware that they had plentiful supplies of all of this equipment that maybe had just recently come back in. Um, so thank you, Tyler and Bart, and you know, working to shop locally and support our businesses who have all of this. Um, I think you know we're talking about the operations of getting open. This is a huge expense center for businesses that we didn't have before. The enhanced cleaning multiple times a day, all of the equipment. But we have sourced um, and you know have installed the panels and shields for uh, safe opening around the um, admissions and and store areas. And uh, masks will be required. I don't know if everybody's. Um, designing their own logo face masks for their employees. I think there's a, an opportunity there for uh, design elements, but um, we've, I'm under, I understand I've been finding enough equipment to prepare for opening. So Brian, I know you have many more properties and um, lots of sites, so it might be different for you. Yeah, it's, you know, a, a cleaning solution is often like, a really hard one you know it's just the the volume of the things that you need really like so hand sanitizer now it's like uh, you know like for example at nom cake at the blue steps right we've opened we've got a bottle at the top and a bottle at the bottom so if people are holding on to the rails you know they have plus we're cleaning that twice a day um and you know a lot of times it's not only the ppe that's required but it is and i think i saw a question on staffing but it is the staffing that is required to do all of this cleaning you know and it is it's a lot you know like we're not really right now our restrooms are closed uh at nom cake you know just because what's required in the cleaning of them when you do have them open it's kind of prohibitive just with the staff that we have you know we're not bringing back any seasonals this year we're running all of the properties just with the full-time staff that we have so if you see me at the front gate taking your ticket on saturday you know that's why it's because we're all you know kind of shifting and filling in these roles, uh, you know, outside of our normal job descriptions, because a lot of the people that we rely on to keep these properties ticking just aren't coming back in the same capacity. Um, so when you have to clean your bathroom every hour and, you know, you're running the property with two people, you know, uh, you know, on a, it's, it, it can get really tricky uh, and expensive. And, you know, when you're running on such a limited capacity, uh, right? So we're, we're charging to come onto the grounds uh, $20 a car load as opposed to $20 um, a person. 
Uh, and, you know, if someone can afford that, we're encouraging them to reach out to us. We will absolutely welcome them, um, you know, no cost. Of, but it's, and on most of our other properties are all open for free as well. So, you know, we're all kind of offering these very reduced kind of experiences, charging less for them, having shorter hours. And, you know, that's really kind of affecting, you know, everything from the bottom line, you know, on to, you know, what we can really accomplish on a day-to-day -day basis. Mm. I think this early uh, reopening phase, I think of it as stepping stones to being able to step back into some normalcy of former life, but to do it carefully and to make sure each step is solid and stable and safe, and that we do this in tandem with the watching the health data and making sure the community stays healthy and we protect the uh, scale of the health care community as we did when this first outbreak came upon us. And I think we're just looking at it as a long game to be able to build, rebuild capacity, but to start with uh, being able to welcome people back, to create art experience, experiences, beautiful outdoor experiences, and then we'll be able to grow and build on those things. And once some of the businesses can open and some of the cultural organizations can open, it, it drives the restaurant businesses, it drives all the other services, um, that we've been talking about and that is what will begin to regrow the economy so it's going to take some time but if we could get started then we have something to build on uh, excuse Mindy, me for a moment while I close windows because the lawnmower is about to come around no worries <laughs> well I, I was just gonna to also mention when it when it comes to cleaning supplies and and PPE we have really focused on buying locally and and i think that um you know if it's plexiglass and and finding a great company in pittsfield or if it's um you know zogix reaching out to us even pr even you know and right before all this started to say hey we're here that's that has really been amazing for us as a community that we're all helping each other out and um and I and I think it's you know it's frustrating when things are on back order and when you when things are unknown and um, and the shipping cost and is it going to come in time and um, and Amazon and all that <laughs> all that stuff so so if we could if we could really rely on our local partners as much as we can because I know that that they've really already stepped up um, which has been amazing. Yeah. Um... I think the the local supply chain, both both in in terms of community support, but also in terms of people rising to the occasion and helping to support larger agencies, smaller agencies, individual households, has been immense here in the Berkshires for sure. Um, so um, just being conscientious of the time, we are uh, past the eleven o'clock hour. Um, so just as like a, a final um, moment here that we have together, you know, I'd love it if each of you, you know, could sort of just send off our audience, our attendees with, you know, some final thoughts, um, you know, kind of the, what are you looking most forward to as we go forward as well? You know, there, there's definitely some silver linings here, as we've, we've noted over the course of the conversation, many challenges, we're not denying that, but um, there's opportunities as well. And so, you know, if, if you just want to kind of uh, make a final, you know, send off to the attendees here joining us, um, just to, to close us out for this morning. Sure, I, you know, I, I am optimistic about the Berkshires in this, you know, and I think it's, it is challenging for sure. And I think that a lot of people in the Berkshires are going to be hurting this summer, which I think we have to always keep front of mind, you know, as we go through this, you know, and, but just the way that we've responded to this as a community, one, has been just so encouraging. And two, I just feel like also it's just, you know, again, a personal reflection. It's just, it's really given me and like, I feel like even our organization a chance to just get back to basics, you know, and just really rethink of things of just, you know, this is nature. This is what our core mission is, like bringing these places to life and 
giving them, you know, to everyone to enjoy, you know, forever, for always is, you know, what we're here for. And no matter what's going on, and I think that that's what the Berkshire has made the Berkshire so special for so long. And I think people are going to rediscover that. They're going to reconnect to that. And I think it's going to make us stronger in the end. I would echo that, Brian. I think uh, Lindsay summed it up, the unique combination of art and nature are natural healers. And we are in a wonderful position to help heal the trauma in our community and in our nation uh, that we've been going through with this pandemic. Um, at the museum, there's been such an embrace of our digital programming. We have 100 people signed up for a sketch class this evening from all over the country. And we've been able to bring uh, experiences into people's homes, families who are schooling their children, teachers who are looking for lesson plans. There are just really wonderful ways we've still been able to connect with people and to be able to uh, return to the galleries and offer some really uplifting and fun uh, filled with humor, but important messaging exhibitions this summer, um, I hope will be uh, widely enjoyed and bring some healing to our community. And I think for for me here, thank you to everyone. Thank you to the panelists. Thank you to One Berkshire for the support that you've offered throughout this and for putting this together. Um, what I'm looking forward to the most will be to welcome our colleagues back and and have information to give them and to to do as much as we can to reassure them um, because i know that we all need that and and that has been the hardest i think for for us as a company is not having the answers because we try to have the answers and if we don't have them we will seek them out and they're hard to find right now. And so I think that that's what I'm looking forward to the most. And, and also just the support of the, the community. I think we really have been focusing for the past couple of years on opening our doors to the community, something that we, we was really missing for a while. And I wanna keep that going because I think that as we all heal through this, as Lori said, we're gonna need each other more than ever. And, and we wanna make sure that we could be there for each other. Well, on that note, um, thank you all. Uh, this has been an incredible conversation and you're, you're a great group of representatives to be able to speak to this topic. We, we chose well, I guess you could say, um, but we really do appreciate uh, both the commitment to conversations like these, but just in general, the entire ecosystem of the Berkshires and the, the role that you all play and your organizations play um, at, you know, not just in the good times, but also the challenging times. Um, and looking ahead to what our future can be together. So um, I you know, just wanna give a, a, one more shout out and thanks to uh, my colleagues at One Berkshire, uh, especially Christine Hoyt, who's our wizard behind the curtain and the team at PCTV who are uh, live streaming this right now. Uh, and for Lindsay as well, who you know, spoke through me via text message as best we could um, to get the, the full uh, load of information out there. Uh, in some way, shape, or form. Uh, we, we're gonna be continuing these, uh, these town halls. We will have one next Friday. We will be announcing uh, that topic uh, in the near future, uh, just getting some final cogs in place before that happens. Um, but we hope that everyone can uh, come back and join us for these. We, we continue to see this as a, uh, an opportunity to have discussions that really fit the needs and um, relevant moments here in the Berkshires specifically. Um, and we really appreciate everyone uh, joining us as part of the conversation, both as panelists and attendees uh, and viewers later on. So um, thank you all. Um, and I, I just, I said this last time, I'll say this again. Uh, we'll all get through this together. And I look forward to doing that with all of you. So thank you. And I give a hug of hope. Thank you. To everyone. <laughs> Big hugs. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Thank Bye. you.